right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to Data Quality for the Skeptical. My name is Britta Lyons. I'm a data research analyst here at Clearwater. I've been here for about two years. I've been doing data for about seven now. Uh, and data quality is something I'm very passionate about, so I'm really excited that you're all here. A um, couple things before we get started. If you have a question, feel free to stop me. Um, but we're also having a little bit of time at the end for questions. Um, there's also going to be a survey sent out after the conference. I'd love feedback, um, any questions, etc. So, quick outline here. Uh, first, why is data quality a priority? Um, how to get started, some ideas on that. Some uh, techniques for diagnosing and finding those, those data quality issues, as well as some ideas on how to resolve it and ongoing. So, let's go ahead and get started. Why make data quality a priority? Why should we allocate resources to it? If you're here, chances are you have some, some reasons for that, <laughs> why it's important. But I wanted to start off with an epic example. So this is the Mars Climate Orbiter. Uh, it was built in 1998 by NASA with a, a team. Um, it cost $125 million. It was designed to orbit Mars and report on the climate, but then also to serve as a relay station for future missions. Unfortunately, after a nine-month interplanetary journey, it became a smear on the atmospheric windshield of the red planet. The question, of course, is what happened? Um, the postmortem revealed that the team that were building the accelerometer used the English, or used the English uh, unit of measure uh, pound seconds, while the team piloting it thought they were getting Newton seconds, the metrics. So kind of a space epic version of the inches versus centimeters mix up. Um, again, $125 million plus lots of scientific research that went poof. Unfortunately, this kind of post-mortem crisis, and then we dig through it, is very common with data quality issues. Um, so I wanted to address it right up front. Um, why do we not want to have this cycle of crisis and, and then digging through? Well, first off, it, it creates this dichotomy of heroes versus villains. We're on this epic quest to find the problem. It's very timely. It's difficult to replicate. There, it's, um, it's a very reactive view. We only see what comes to the surface. We don't know what's actually underneath. Maybe it's an iceberg. Maybe the water is clear. <clears throat> um, and all that uncertainty tends to, to damage business. We're not confident, both internally and externally. So what's the alternative? What are we trying to do? I um, found this quote here from David Lotion. In essence, performance objectives center on maximizing productivity and goodwill while reducing organizational risks and operating costs. Now, he's spe specifically talking about data quality, but it's very generalizable, right? What we want is to increase productivity and goodwill, decrease risks and costs, right? Um, data quality is one of those key pieces for businesses to improve productivity. Uh, there's a, an estimate it's about eight times easier to use clean data. Uh, goodwill, obviously, if we trust it, people are happier, right? Um, Risks, if we're getting ahead of it, we're finding the, the chaos before it happens. And costs, um, IBM came out with a, a statistic a couple years ago that the US economy loses $3 trillion a year due to bad data. So let's save some of that. <laughs> um, again, this is from David Lotion's Practitioner's Guide to Data Quality Improvement. Highly recommend, used it extensively. So what are we talking about when we say data? Not just the coolest member of NextGen, but um, pricing, transaction data, and getting beyond that. Um, maybe it's uh, business data, maybe it's system data, time to output, how long does it take to, for me to get data to my customer? What are our errors like? We're gonna talk about building some of those error statistics, and that becomes the next level of data that we can use to improve the data that we've got. Um, I'm using very basic examples here, but the principles can be generalized to whatever project we're working on. So. How do we get started? This is a trick question because we start, right? You pick something, you dig in. Um, chances are there's already something that, that exists, um, something that we're using to identify data quality, but maybe we're not looking at it as a data quality tool. Things like maybe you've got a standardized form or a sanity checks, time stamps on those changes. As we start to use the, the data quality lens, we see the gaps, we see the, the things that we could improve. Maybe we formalize those sanity checks. Maybe we, we create that as a secondary layer to make sure that we're catching these, these issues as they come through the pipeline. 
Uh, this iterative process goes by many names. My favorite is IQIP. Um, identify, quantify, implement, and perfect, as proposed by Knight and Byrne in 05. Uh, essentially, we identify what's going on with the system. We quantify the performance we want to see. We implement checks to see if that's happening. And then we perfect both the, the system for finding these problems and the data itself. Um, what are we talking about What for good data quality? What is good data quality? Uh, I picked my th three favorite um, attributes. Uh, good data is accurate, complete, and timely, right? Um, not just is it correct, but also is it auditable? If I have a data point, can I trace it back? Can I see all the permutations that have happened, any transformations? Um, is it complete? Is it internally and externally consistent? Does it contain all of the relevant fields for my customer? Uh, is it accessible? Is it timely? Not just does it arrive on time, which is very important, but also does it apply to the time period that I care about? This is definitely not the only list. Um, each project is gonna have a different set of priorities. Maybe for a, a given project, timeliness is most important. We can give generalities as long as it's up front. Um, and it's gonna change over the, the, t the growth of a period. Excuse me. It's gonna change over the growth of a project. <laughs> um, at the beginning, maybe we care a lot about a couple of data points being completely accurate. But then as we go, timeliness might become more important. Um, it's one of those things where, again, that iterative process of reassessing what's going on in our, in our project. So, how do we know about all this communication, right? Um, who are we talking to? People upstream, people downstream, people midstream. People midstream, the people who know the, the quirks of the data, the things that are going on. Uh, it's probably you guys, since you're here, care about data quality, right? Um, the people working on it. People downstream, um, whether that's an actual customer clicking on a button, or maybe it's another program, another team, another project. In a sense, they're a customer. Uh, the people upstream, in a sense, we're their customer. You know, um, I've worked on a lot of different projects where we had a lot of vendors providing us data. And the big ones, I was always surprised, you know, kind of tentatively, do you guys have this? Oh yeah, we've got that for you, let me hand that off. Um, or if they didn't, they were worked with me to build it. That's not always the case, but it's always worth an ask, right? Um, it gets it in their, their mind. Um, all of this information pours into a roadmap, whether that's a formalized contract or a service level agreement, whatever, whatever that's gonna look like for your team, for your project, it's gonna have some key components. Uh, first is specifics of success. How do we know if we're providing good data? Uh, what does it look like? When does it arrive? What's the scope of this foray into data quality improvement? Uh, are we gonna look at all of the sources? Keeping in mind that measurable is not necessarily meaningful. Maybe we've got some sources that could be useful, but we want to hold on to those for, for a minute. Uh, focusing on, on what's applicable right now. Accountability. Um, not talking like, you know, who are we going to call if something goes wrong, but who are we going to call when something goes wrong? Um, <laughs> what's the coverage? What's the report? Uh, reporting going to look like? And what's the feedback loop like? If I change something, is it going to just go off into the void and I don't know about it? Is there something I can do in advance to make sure that I have a feedback loop? Um, also, what happens if something goes wrong? You know, is this a $5 change? Is this a $5 million change? If we're in the healthcare industry, is someone's life going to be drastically impacted? Knowing what that feedback loop looks like can be extremely powerful. And of course, the last major piece is planning to revisit the plan. Um, I'm always surprised and kind of delighted by the new uses people find for data. You know, I come back in six months and they found relationships that I never would have dreamed of. Um, but it's that, that new revitalization that we also want to protect. We want to come back and make sure we're not going to break it as we, we make changes. Uh, two more things to keep in mind as we're getting started. Technology, uh, whether we build or buy. Um, we want to make sure that we're, we're using technology for the situation, not trying to kind of shoehorn everything into the technology. Uh, for example, ticketing systems, extremely powerful. But if I'm logging thousands of errors a day, maybe not create a ticket for every one of those. Maybe we have a, a separate logging system that feeds into that ticket system. Um, documentation, not a dirty word, I promise. Uh, depth depends on product maturity. If it's changing every five minutes, not worth a lot of time. But once we start to accumulate things like product names, complex ideas, acronyms, um, it can be really useful to have a, a central location for people to look up and, and just to reference, both on the team, 
but especially downstream. There's an old adage that if your customer doesn't understand what's going on, they're either not going to use the product or they're going to use it wrong, obviously. Neither of which are ideal, but. Okay, enough about getting started. How do we actually see what's underneath the surface? Um, spot checking is the most basic. Probably all have done this. I know it's a little bit of a hang. Uh, the first time I ever heard the term spot checking, I actually was checking documents for spots. It was kind of painful. Um, what I'm talking about here, though, is you take that random sampling, you go through it with your subject experts, kind of shake the tree, see what comes out. Gives you a general idea of what's going on. You know, if you've already got things advanced in the system, skip over this. But if you're looking at a beginning system, this is a good place to start. Um, keeping in mind that you're, you're still not getting the full picture. This is just a, a random sampling. Maybe those things are not actually seen in the rest of the documents. So, moving on to complexity. Pre-pipeline checks. Uh, can I get a raise of hands? <laughs> Who here has had the unfortunate experience of a customer reporting problem, you trace it all the way through the system, and find out a file didn't arrive? Yeah, right? It, it's, it's not fun. Um, so, shout out for Python. <laughs> um, I created a quick script here, uh, just a, threw it in a Jupyter notebook, a couple libraries, and it just goes out and finds my, my file, uh, file folder, prints out what's in it, and then counts the rows that are in one of the files. This is a really, really basic proof of, proof of concept. Maybe this would be helpful, maybe we could formalize it, automate it. Shout out for the talk on automation later today. It's gonna be awesome. Um, this kind of checking for known issues before it happens, we're, we're getting ahead of the problem. Um, another idea, as we're, we're starting um, looking at our, our data sources, source ranking. For example, if I'm looking for my dream house, I'm probably going to start on something like Zillow. Rather than going to a realtor, I'm going to check out some neighborhoods, find out I can't afford the bench. And then I'm going to come back and, and talk to a realtor when I find something I actually care about. Um, we can do that with data points too. Sometimes we need to, to have a, a general idea and sometimes we need something really specific and that in-depth knowledge of what the customer needs and what data sources we have available is really powerful in getting ahead of data quality issues. So, data enhancements. Next major tool that we've got. Um, combining sources is extremely powerful. Some obvious gains. We can extend coverage, fill in the gaps, um, use it for validation. If we've got two sources that have something similar, we can compare, make sure that it makes sense. If we've got two columns that relate to each other and we know that they, they do, we can use that to leverage, make sure that we're not creating problems for ourselves down the road. Natural extension of that is extrapolating data. Um, it's the first of my uh, mythical zoo data sets here. So we've got, uh, the, the one on the top is just animal name, tracking chip IDs, some information about where this animal fits in this mythical zoo, right? Second set is chip ID, date, time, and location, kind of where the animal is at a given time, right? And looking at those two, there's probably a correlation between chip ID and tracking chip ID, right? Shout out for primary keys and identifiable linking. This is another place where documentation can save you a lot of time hunting and a lot of worry. Um, but once we've got this information, we can start to grow our knowledge, right? Uh, we learned that here, this G123456 is Geraldine the zebra, and L223456 is Leo the lion, and they're in the same place at the same time. And maybe that's not good. <laughs> maybe we want an error. Taking this back to the, the data realm, maybe this is two sources and they're conflicting, and we could create a, an error report in advance as we're, as we're seeing this data come through the system. Um, another thing that, that we frequently use, but maybe don't think of as a data quality uh, tool, SQL, col <laughs> excuse me, um, SQL column data types. Um, for example, okay, apparently that's the wrong button. <laughs> <coughs> there we go. Okay, SQL column data types. We can edit that out post, right? Um, can be very useful for pre-screening. <laughs> Uh, if we've got a, a CSV file that's trying to load or an FTP file trying to load and it's trying to stick in a varchar into an int field, it's going to throw us an error, right? That helps. It, it may not tell us if it's the right value, but it tells us that it's at least in the right realm, right? Um, another thing with these, uh, I've got a name column here. It's a varchar for 50. Is that big enough? Maybe. Maybe not. Depends on my, my system. 
but at least I know that it's not going to try and put three lines of data into that one field and then publish it on a website. Not that I've seen that happen before. <laughs> um, <clears throat> other things, uh, getting outside of just the SQL realms, useful for both SQL and out, and no SQL. Um, standard formatting, the classic example of this is dates, right? Uh, I've got three dates there. And if you look at them, they're all the same date, right? How much faster would it be if they were all formatted the same? Um, it's, well, um, it's a simple thing, but it helps with validation, makes it a little easier. Another thing that can help is one concept per data point, or avoiding overloading. Um, for example, back to our mythical zoo, uh, we've got animal trading, tracking chip and a group column, which has got some interesting data. If I wanted to put together a list of all of the birds of prey, I'd have to parse out this column though. How could I get around that? How could I clean this data so that I'm not gonna have to work harder to get clean data. Um, maybe we create a second call or a second table and use Boolean fields instead. You know, is the bald eagle a pop culture? And it's debatable, but I'd say yes. No, put a, put a yes. Is it an apex predator? Yes. Is it a birds of prey? Yes. Is it polar? No. No. And that gives us a, an increased ability to to look at the data quickly. Um, it also gets us around some other potential problems. Um, for example, we've got two penguins in this zoo. What happens if I only change one of the groups? <laughs> then we have uh, conflicting data, right? If we have it in a separate table and we're using references, we get around that problem. Not ah, difficult to use and validate. So um, manual entry is one of the, the most classically difficult things for getting clean data. Um, I went ahead and stole the 2019 user conference sign up. <laughs> um, I happen to know that's a formatted email box. It requires an at symbol and a dot usually followed by three characters. It's something simple but helps to validate downstream and that concept we can really expand. Um, the classic gotcha that's useful to think about here is zip code. I've actually been on a team where we tried to, to set up zip code. Um, we were thinking USA, so we made it numerical. <laughs> and then we had a Canadian customer. <laughs> and they use not just alphanumerical, but also dashes. Um, made life a little, little exciting. But knowing that's what's going on gives us a lot of power. Uh, another epic example of this, the European Space Agency's Arian 5. Uh, there might be a little bit of a theme with my examples, in case you hadn't noticed. Um, 1996, uh, they launched for the first time um, it cost about $350 million, uh, multinational, again, European Space Agency, lots of people involved. Unfortunately, 90 minutes into launch, there was a terrible problem, and it became a $350 million fireworks show. Uh, the postmortem in this case revealed that it was an overflow. Uh, essentially, they'd reused the software from the last version and didn't account for a larger acceleration number. The software didn't know what to do and went boom. So, again, that knowing your system, knowing what to expect, and, and iterating through, making sure that, that you check the assumptions. Um, if you're interested, the YouTube videos of this are actually quite sobering. Uh, the, the team are, are interesting to, to watch, but it's a good fireworks display. Um, <laughs> something to help get ahead of this. Yeah. Oh, unmanned, right? Unmanned, yes, yes. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> unmanned, Wouldn't, yeah. Um, and actually, it's gone on to be super useful. It's one of their most powerful um, rockets for getting to the uh, International Space Station. They've got multiple versions of it. Um, thank you. So data profiling <laughs> can help us get ahead of some of these problems. We're, we're looking at the data that we've got, trying to find patterns um, and problems. For example, um, one of the first things most of us do when we get a new data set, we check for nulls, check for duplicates, start to find out what's going on with the data. Uh, I've got some sample transactional data here, and one of the things that comes to mind first is I've got what looks like a duplicate. That's, you know, same information, tra transaction ID, total purchase, uh, date, customer ID. Did the customer come in and buy the same thing at the same time, for the same amount? Probably not. This is probably a duplicate, right? But jumping ahead to, to solving these problems, what happens if I delete this row? Have we already charged the customer twice? Have we already shipped? 
have we already shipped twice but only charged him once? Um, questions like that can, can help us start to prepare for not causing problems downstream. Um, anomaly detection um, is extremely powerful. Uh, I've got another one here where it's much bigger than the other prices. Uh, it's relationally inconsistent with its fellows. Um, I wouldn't really call it a statistical analysis because it's so short, but we, we kind of did a, a small statistical analysis looking at it. And it looks, looks wrong, it looks statistically significant, but we, maybe this is part of a bigger data set. For example, if this is like a, a corner hardware store where generally the purchases are 15 to $20 and then occasionally someone comes in and buys a table saw, the more data we have of that, the more we're gonna know if this is statistically significant and we can zero in on the things we actually really care about. Um, another tool for preparing for good data, end-to-end -end evaluation. This is especially useful for systems that have kind of data transformations. Usually we think about going from output, tracing it back to input, but both directions can be very powerful. Um, again, it gives us that accountability, what pieces of the pipeline are are being handled by which uh, pieces of code or which teams. Um, helps us identify the margin for error. If I change something at the beginning, what's the impact on the end? If I change one data point, is that gonna impact one customer or 100? And uh, to what degree? Um, again, it's that auditability going back and forward. Uh, one thing that I found very powerful on a lot of the, the projects I've worked on, uh, if we have a, a known issue that keeps coming up, I'll save that and send that through the system occasionally, just as we make changes to see if it's, see if we've broken anything, to make sure that we haven't got any regressions. Um, possibly the most powerful tool that we have um, are rules. I like to think of it as a filtration system with some of the same limitations. Um, if we restrict it too much, we put too much uh, stress on our components, in this case, you know, the people working on the system and the software itself. If we have it too permissive, things start to float down to our end user that we'd really rather not, right? Um, but what does this actually look like? What, how do we build these things? Maybe this is a series of SQL queries that feed into a report. Maybe this is more formalized. Maybe this is intervention in the software itself to pull out, uh, pull out bad data. Um, there's two main types of rules. There's uh, what I call passive rules. Now it's, maybe this is a rule of thumb, you know, general business logic, prices probably shouldn't be about this amount. If it is, keep account of that, something we wanna keep track of. Then there's what I call hard stop rules, something that requires manual intervention. If something's trying to put a, a varchar into an integer field, we know we need to go look at that, right? Um, how do we build these? Again, there's two, two basic types. There's domain logic rules based on known relationships, uh, things that, again, we know are, are common. Um, and then there's discovered rules. As we're doing those statistical analysis, um, to find anomalies, we can start to build an idea of what's normal and put those rules in place as well. That gives us an edge, because it's not just the, the obvious business logic rules, but it's also the things that, that exist but maybe aren't as obvious um, right at first. Um, again, we wanna make sure we're not, not putting too much strain on the system, so flexibility is an issue. Uh, ranges can be very powerful for this. Um, David Lotion uh, comments on an interesting psychological thing. As humans, we tend to have a much narrower range for a value. We, we think of things based on patterns, but we also know that the system's tolerance is downstream. So it can be powerful to use, a, again, a statistical range, get that wider range than, than we would naturally get, but also keeping in mind that the tolerance is downstream. Rules are also super useful if you have, um, again, those service level agreements or, or compliance checks. If we've got a government regulation that applies, by all means, we can put something in, in, check, in place to check for those before it goes out, out. So we know that we're not creating problems for ourselves. Um, another idea is it's not restricted to output. Sometimes we think of a rule system as the last step before we send it to our, our customer. Um, I've got a, a sample little pipeline here. It's very basic, probably won't look like yours. But um, we've got raw data, and then we do a file check. Maybe if the, it's an update file that doesn't come, we pull the data that should have been updated so that we're not propagating data we know is wrong. Um, and we go through the transformations, we have a filter, and pull out anything that violates it. So that multiple places 
to, to clean the data can be very powerful. Um, metrics. Okay, what do I mean by metrics? Because it's kind of a buzzword at this point. <laughs> it's, what are we measuring to know how data quality stands currently? How do we know what's actually going on? Again, keeping in mind that measurable is not necessarily meaningful. I can count how many emails I get a day, but it's probably not actually relevant <laughs> to a business objective. I mean, if I'm getting over a thousand, that might be, but you know. Um, so we wanna make sure that, that as we build these metrics, as we look at them, it's obviously applicable to what we're doing, right? Um, and keeping in mind the target audience, so it's twofold. The first one is the data quality improvers, the people on the ground. This is kind of the equivalent of handing sonar to a battleship. You know, we're plumbing the depths, we see what's going on. Um, and those people that are working with the data, it's extremely powerful for them, or for us. Um, and then also for the decision makers, the people who are deciding where to deploy the troops. These can be very useful. So, what does a good metric look like? First, it's clear, uh, it's measurable, uh, it's relevant, <laughs> uh, it's also controllable. Maybe if there's a problem that's coming through and we're keeping track of it but we can't control it, we kick that upstream. Hand it to the people handing, who, are, who are sending it to us and say, hey, could you fix this for us? Um, representable, uh, something I can graph, something I can show so people can understand it. Trackable, I can see the changes from week to week. And auditable, uh, again, want to be able to, to not just have a number but understand what's building those numbers and go back and fix the actual problems. So we've got a lot of different methods. We've looked at our data, we've gone through it. What do we do to fix it? Um, what's the triage? Uh, chances are, if we've dug into the data quality, there's something that's been bugging us. So by all means, we fix that first, right? Um, we pull any of the low-hanging fruit, something that, that's quick. We grab those first. Um, but, yeah? How does that going to affect this approach to maybe understanding the fix that? Excellent. Excellent, that is a good point. So we wanna make sure that um, the question was how, how's it going to affect uh, systems upstream and downstream? Um, we wanna make sure that we're, we're taking that into account as we change things, and I'm, I'm gonna to get to that in a minute, so thank you. Very, very good point. Um, as we're deciding which things to attack first, uh, it can be very useful to keep in mind the, the Pareto Principle, also known as the 80-20 rule. Um, it, this is a very broad rule, but as it applies to this, um, suggests that 80% of the customer reported problems are actually from 20% of the underlying causes. So if we can focus on those 20%, we get more bang for the buck, right? Um, also, uh, as we're looking for prioritization, what's critical, right? If it's not critical, it goes to the bottom of the list. Uh, is it frequent? It can be easy to chase the white whale that shows up every six months, right? Um, is it correctable? Again, if not correctable, kick it upstream. Is it preventable? What can we put in place upstream to, to make sure that we're catching this in advance? Um, to that end, it can be useful to have a standard reaction plan because we, we know that we're gonna have problems. We're trying to catch as many as we can, but we wanna keep that trust, that confidence high. Um, so a standard reaction plan, so we're not panicking, we know what we're doing, can be very useful. This is a very formalized one, confirm, notify, log, diagnose, evaluate options, correct, improve, prevent. You can see how each of those pieces would be useful. But it boils down to two key pieces. First, we report the problem and we fix the problem, right? By reporting the problem, we have this new data. We have a trackability. Uh, for example, if a file comes late the day after a federal holiday, that's pretty easy to see, right? But if it comes late a day and a week after a federal holiday, that's a little bit harder. But once we have that data of, of what errors we've seen, we can start to find those patterns as we do again the this, uh, anomaly detection on our new layer, layer of data. Um, fixing the problem, uh, to your point, um, and to anybody who's ever had to update in production, <laughs> you wanna beware introducing new issues, right? You wanna make sure that we're not causing problems downstream. Um, so this may look different. Maybe we update, maybe we delete an item, maybe we combine things. Um, Again, it depends very much on the project, but getting, getting out of this um, kind of box that we end up in frequently of, well, we've got to fix this problem. I'm thinking about how to, <laughs> how to prepare to, to clean it before it becomes an issue. Um, reporting. 
okay, we've created these metrics, they exist, we've done all these things. How do we, how do we make it so that we can actually use them? Who's watching these metrics? Um, the rule of thumb, severity dictates the level of contact. You know, if I've got a missile defense system, by all means, red lights, give me text messages, I want that. If it's a rule of thumb, maybe it goes on a report um, or a dashboard. As it gets more urgent, maybe I get an email with urgent in it. Uh, or an IM, um, some systems that we've got um, can alert you via IM or text message if something's going wrong. Um, whatever it is that we're building though, it's got two key components. First is the executive or scoreboard version, um, and then the drill down. Uh, what do I mean by executive? It's generally a visualization used for prioritization, easy to read. For example here, got small little, little report. Uh, accuracy is green, completeness is green, but timeliness is red. Something's wrong with timeliness. We just deploy the troops to timeliness. The first question is, what's wrong, right? So we have that drill down version where it starts to give us the, uh, the deeper understanding, um, that audit trail of, okay, well, we've got certain percentage that we're on time, certain percentage that we're late, how many of them were late, and by how much, all the way down to the, the level of which report was late, by, by how much, so I can actually go out and fix it. Otherwise, it's kind of like shouting fire and then walking away. Um, ongoing, um, we want to, I, I, it's kind of a mantra for me, you audit regularly, you monitor continuously, and automate for sanity. Right, we want to keep going back through this audit process to make sure that we understand what's going on. We want to monitor the things that we've created and automate those as much as possible. Because again, this is, mm -hmm. this is to help us as we dig into the data. Um, the last point here is that communication is key. Again, that upstream, downstream, and the people on the ground. Um, communication and understanding what's going on with the system is going to be absolutely vital. So, thank you, and are there any questions? Go for it. How do you deal with uh, type one versus type two statistical errors? Okay, type two, one versus type two statistical errors. I'm not actually a mathematician. Um, I don't think we're talking at that level. Oh. No, yeah, yeah. But, but generally, statistical errors, um, one of the things that we've done is, um, again, create those reports, find ways of, of ranking them based on the confidence um, that we have that they're, they're a problem. Um, I hope that kind of answers the question. Not really. Yeah. Were there any other questions? Brett, I understood yeah. what you covered really didn't get into the machine learning aspects of stuff. It Not really. It's more like making it clean mm -hmm. maybe for that. Yeah, yeah. That can be um, one of the most time consuming things for machine learning is making sure that we have clean data before it, it starts reaching our, <laughs> our, our models. Because um, if, it, if it's wrong, then it's going to create models that are skewed. That's so. Yeah. <laughs> you did have one slide up here that showed uh, violations being rejected. Mm -hmm. um, that, that scared me. It, it, that must be in a system where you can yes. tolerate losing, violating data. Right, um, and thank you for... Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, we, I had a slide for um, the sample pipeline where we actually removed violating data. And how, how do we... I'm going to rephrase your question. How do we reintegrate that in, into the system? Um, one of the things that's been very powerful for us is um, removing that data temporarily. And again, it's that uh, level of severity. We, we contact people, have a, a notification that we need to go look at that data and find out what's going on, and then reintroduce that back in. Uh, keeping in mind, again, of course, our, our timeliness uh, requirements. So we, we make sure that we're we're providing the data that we've agreed to. So, yeah. So there's a feedback loop. You can exactly. Fix that data so that you can't just throw it out, but you got to fix it before you feed it back. Yep. In. Yep. It's that feedback loop, and making sure that that we're not removing data that that is that is key. So. All right. Any other questions? All right. I think I'm a little early, but we'll go ahead and, and end. So thank you so much for coming.